I'd like to welcome everyone to a new program within the Wellness, Resilience, and Survivorship program, which is um, one bite at a, at a time. And um, if I can just give you a little background on how we came to this point, some of you, I, um, I hope, already know Megan Laszlo, who's going to be leading today's session. She really was the pioneer in starting our uh, Nutrition in Your Kitchen program, which is a cooking uh, education and demonstration program up in our kitchen on the fifth floor. If you have not attended and you are interested, please do contact us to see if it's a good fit for you. Um, but we wanted to, now that we have this great technology, right, where we can connect, uh, have some time where we can profile little topics in nutrition and do a deep dive uh, this was meant to be focused, maybe, um, and Megan can clarify, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just so that we don't keep people on this platform in the middle of the day for long periods of time, but we can learn something. I can tell you when I was in medical school, which I, I feel like was not that long ago, but it, I guess it has been, you know, we were, when we did nutrition, we were basically taught, you know, uh, good nutrition is not eating McDonald's, or it's just counting your calories. And that was the extent of it. And as, um, our, our, our dietary experts will tell you there is so much research evolving over the last decade or two on the value of what we put in our mouth and how it may impact our well-being. And, and as and as Megan is going to talk about, maybe even our um, health um, in in other ways and in, in biological mechanisms as well. So um, by way of introduction, again, um, Megan has been working with our community, our population, I believe for almost 12 years, she uh, completed her undergraduate and graduate studies in nutrition. Uh, again, she is the pioneer for the Nutritionary Kitchen Program. And um, what I'd like to do is ask you as you are to stay on mute, but we will take questions um, either through the chat or through the audience as it comes up. This is meant to be interactive as much as we can. And I'll try to facilitate um, as best as possible. So Megan, thank you for leading this and the show is all yours. Thank you for the introduction. Let me, um, let me share my screen. Okay. Is everyone able to see my presentation? We're good? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Well, thank you. Um, Thank you for inviting me to give this first lecture, and I'm so pleased to be able to talk about um, to talk about mushrooms in this format because we, it's something we don't often get to do as a clinical dietitian is to educate in this way. Um, so I'm really excited to to be here and talking to you about this. Um, I wanted to talk about mushrooms because I feel that there's a lot of growing interest in mushrooms in terms of edible mushrooms as well as uh, mushroom dietary supplements in the oncology population, and we hear about this from our patients quite a bit. Some of this may be related to the recent documentaries that have come out about mushrooms. Um, and I also feel that it seems like it's mushroom season right now because mushrooms are more widely available in grocery stores um, during the holidays. So I thought it'd be a great time to talk about it. Uh, so some of my objectives um, were to talk about guidelines for mushroom consumption or, or lack thereof. Um, as well as um, talk about some of the different nutrients, essential nutrients and bioactive nutrients that are found in mushrooms and to discuss some preparation tips as well. And so these are our cancer prevention recommendations from the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research. Um, and research suggests that um, following the same evidence-based guidelines that help prevent cancer may also help guard against its return. And studies do show that following these guidelines is associated with lower risk of cancer incidence and mortality. Um, and you can see here that there's a recommendation to eat a diet that's rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans um, without a specific recommendation for mushrooms. I also wanted to highlight our uh, 2020 to 2025 dietary guidelines for Americans. These guidelines are set by the United States uh, Department of Agriculture and Health and Human Services. And so what they recommend in terms of um, mushrooms is, is really for an individual that's on a 2000 calorie diet to eat about two and a half cups of vegetables or cup equivalents of vegetables per day. 
And then they have recommendations for different vegetables on a weekly basis. And mushrooms get lumped into this vegetable category of um, trying to eat about four cup equivalents per week of mushrooms or Brussels sprouts or eggplant or radishes or tomatillos. So there's really no specific recommendation for mushroom consumption. And they're often treated as a vegetable when they are not a vegetable. So over the past few years, there have been uh, more studies specifically analyzing mushroom consumption and its relationship to health. And um, one dose response meta-analysis indicated that higher mushroom consumption was associated with a 45% lower risk of cancer than no mushroom consumption. And so the high mushroom consumption was eating about an eighth of a cup to a fourth of a cup of mushrooms per day. Um, so by that rationale, eating a cup to a cup and three quarters of a cup um, of mushrooms per week may have a similar benefit. And, but this also may indicate a protective role of mushrooms against cancer. And an inverse um, relationship was found between mushroom consumption and prostate cancer incidence, um, as well as there are, mushrooms appear to protect against mild cognitive impairment and delay neurodegeneration. I'm just going to offer a quick poll of the room um, of how often you are eating mushrooms. If you wanna check in with yourself um, and think about how often you're eating them currently, mm -hmm. <laughs> daily, weekly, every two weeks, monthly, just so we can take that into consideration as well. It's a good thing to ask yourself. Okay, um, so mushrooms are a nutrient dense, but low energy food. Um, so they contain large amounts of essential nutrients uh, like selenium, which helps the body make antioxidants, um, copper that helps make red blood cells and um, potassium, which is good for cardiovascular health and lowering blood pressure as well as B vitamins that have a direct impact on energy levels, brain function, and cellular metabolism. Um, vitamin D, um, they're one of the only non-animal-based sources of vitamin D. And we know that wow. vitamin D helps the body absorb and retain calcium and phosphorus, um, wow. and they also contain fiber. So, you know, while mushrooms are sometimes used as a meat substitute and dishes <clears throat> like portobello mushroom burgers or mushroom taco tacos, um, they do lack comparable amounts of, of protein and iron and zinc to really make them um, and a protein substitute or a protein food source. And you may see, have seen some mushrooms advertised as containing vitamin D, um, probably at the farmer's market, if you go to farmer's markets. And, and mushrooms are able to make vitamin D in a similar but different way that humans make vitamin D from sunlight exposure. Um, so through UVB light, rays ex light ray exposure, mushrooms can synthesize vitamin D2. Um, and both vitamin D2 and vitamin D3 will raise our, our body's serum levels of vitamin D. And I think it's worth noting that these um, UVB light rays don't pass through glass. And so if you think that you're, you're going to get vitamin D from sitting in front of a window or in your car, you actually can't synthesize vitamin D that way and neither can your mushrooms. Um, so if you wanted to potentially leave your mushrooms out in the sunlight, they could synthesize vitamin D that way. You don't have to buy special vitamin D mushrooms from the store, you can do this yourself. And so if you take uh, mushrooms and leave them in the sun, direct sunlight exposure for about 15 minutes, they can have your daily values worth of vitamin D. And this is a chart showing um, how much vitamin D can be synthesized by leaving different mushrooms um, exposed to UV light. So vitamin D is important for overall health, including cancer prevention. We know that vitamin D supports immune function, gut barrier function, um, antimicrobial synthesis, um, and these may serve as protective factors against colon cancer. There also appears to be a prognostic association between vitamin D levels and survival in patients with colorectal cancer, and an inverse association between vitamin D and breast cancer and postmenopausal but not premenopausal women. And the Endocrine Society has um, 
made a recommendation for uh, a level of 40 to 60, which is about 10 points higher than what would be considered um, within normal limits for vitamin D. Mushrooms also contain fiber, and we know that fiber supports a healthy gut. And a healthy gut plays an important role in maintaining our immune defenses, digesting our food, and communicating with the brain through nerves and hormones. Um, so vitamin D, or, sorry, uh, mushrooms are known for their beta-glucan content, um, which is a type of prebiotic fiber. The prebiotic fiber is the type of fiber that is used by the healthy bacteria in the intestine. They use it as fuel. Um, so it's digested and fermented by our healthy gut bacteria. Um, and prebiotics are known to increase bifidobacteria and lactobacilli bacteria. They can increase calcium absorption and have positive effects on gut barrier permeability. And they also support a healthy immune system. There are many different types of prebiotic fibers and beta-glucans are just one type. Um, specifically, beta-glucans are known to lower LDL cholesterol by reducing cholesterol synthesis, uh, lower fasting glucose, activate immune cells, and reduce inflammation. And beta-glucans are the highest in maitake or hen of the wood mushrooms, shiitake, and reishi mushroom varieties. And so I think some of the more interesting properties of mushrooms are their non-nutritive plant substances or phytonutrients. So these are mushrooms that aren't necessarily classified as an essential vitamin or mineral. And these are known to have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and anti-cancer effects in, in animal and cell studies. Um, so earlier this year, the first ever bioactive nutrient guideline was developed. And this was for um, about 500 milligrams per day of flavanols to reduce risk associated with cardiovascular disease, and diabetes and to improve blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar. And this is a food-based bioactive guideline and not a recommendation for dietary supplements. Um, and this recommendation came along after over 150 randomized control trials and several cohort studies. But I think that we can anticipate uh, more guidelines for bioactive nutrients in the future. Mushrooms also contain antioxidants. So we may not think of mushrooms containing antioxidants because I think we normally think of green tea or chocolate or berries as being good sources, but they, um, they notably contain ergothionine and glutathione. Um, and a lot of the health benefits of mushrooms are largely attributed to ergothionine. And this antioxidant has anti-inflammatory properties and supports the immune system. Uh, ergothionine may also mitigate some of the chronic diseases associated with aging, and some researchers have even called for this to be renamed a longevity vitamin. Um, and the ergothionine concentrations can vary by mushroom type. Um, the shiitake mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, and maitake, or hen of the wood mushrooms, do have higher concentrations than the white button mushroom varieties. Um, so I wanted to talk about a few palatable mushrooms, not all, all of the ones listed here, um, but just a few because there are over 2,000 species of edible mushrooms. Um, and I wanted to call out this mushroom in the photo. This is lion's mane. Uh, I recently saw lion's mane in the grocery store for the first time. Um, so I think it's becoming more widely available and it actually has kind of a, a, a seafood taste to it. Another mushroom that has a briny um, seafood flavor are oyster mushrooms. Um, and these come in different varieties. They can be gray, blue, pink, or king. Um, and they are high in copper. Um, and when I say that they're high in copper, I mean that they have 20% or more of this nutrient per serving. So they have at least 20% of the daily value of this nutrient per serving. And they're also high in B vitamins, um, and they contain beta-glucans and ergothionine. And cell studies have shown that extracts of oyster mushrooms can increase the cytotoxic activity of natural killer cells against breast and lung cancer. Another uh, edible mushroom is shiitake mushrooms. These have an earthy, woodsy taste and a really dense, meaty texture. Um, and they contain pentathetic acid, copper, and selenium, which is also an antioxidant, um, as well as they are known for their beta-glucan content. And I also wanted to talk about button mushrooms because I think when we start talking about mushrooms and comparing them to vegetables, button mushrooms may be seen as like the iceberg lettuce of the mushroom community, and they're really not. Um, and in fact, white button mushrooms are basically a younger version of 
brown mushrooms, cremini mushrooms, and portabella mushrooms. And these more mature versions, like the portabella, have higher concentrations of antioxidants. Button mushrooms are very commonly eaten in the US, and about 90% of the mushrooms that Americans eat are a button mushroom variety. Um, an in vitro study showed that button mushrooms could inhibit aromatase activity and decrease breast cancer cell proliferation, um, which doesn't mean that they're a substitute for medication, but it could, they could play a protective role. So mushrooms have been used in traditional Chinese medicine for thousands of years. And I think in the United States, we're starting to see them more um, available as a dietary supplement, but also as a tea or with hot chocolate or a coffee substitute or a tincture or elixir. Um, and I think it's worth noting that the mushrooms that are sold as a food product are more regulated um, than those sold as dietary supplements. And in the United States, dietary supplements are not standardized and they're not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And this brings up a lot of concerns about the, the content and the quality and the dosing and contaminants such as heavy metals. And so I think just as kind of a disclaimer, there are by ways to evaluate dietary supplements. You know, one is using third party testing um, so that they can test for purity and contaminants. Um, some, some, some companies that undergo this testing may have, um, may advertise it on the label, while others you may have to actually request it from the company. We can also look at consumer lab reports. And I would also give consideration for California's uh, Proposition 65 labeling, which is done for products that contain chemicals known to cause cancer or reproductive harm. Um, and I will also add that um, consumer lab reports uses the Prop 65 um, thresholds for doing their analysis as well. And Prop 65 does have much lower um, limits than even the FDA does. So I think that is something to consider if cons considering using a mushroom supplement. Um, and I think we have to weigh the benefit versus risk with, with supplements in general. And always speak to your medical team before starting a dietary supplement because there could be potential drug nutrient interactions. So that said, I want to talk about turkey tail mushrooms. Um, so there's been significant research on the use of turkey tail in cancer, um, so much so that turkey tail mushroom extracts have been approved as um, an adjunct to cancer treatment in China and Japan. Um, research on turkey tail often uses the polysaccharide extracts, PSK or polysaccharide K, and PSP or polysaccharide P, or the encapsulated mushroom itself. Um, and they've been shown to inhibit cancer cell growth um, in vivo and in vitro um, and may improve quality of life. Um, it may decrease cancer treatment related side effects. And a meta-analysis of 13 different clinical trials that included over 2,500 patients with cancer show that taking turkey tail in addition to conventional therapy reduced five-year uh, mortality by 9% compared with conventional therapy alone. Um, and when individual cancer types were considered, the benefit was most seen in gastric, breast, and colorectal cancer. And then another meta-analysis of 14 different clinical trials showed that taking turkey tail in combination with chemotherapy was associated with a 17% lower risk of mortality in some but not all cancer types when compared with chemotherapy alone. So application of this is kind of unclear since the trials looked at several different types of cancer use varying doses and types of turkey tail mushroom and considerations for the duration of the therapy. <clears throat> so the FDA has not approved turkey tail or polysaccharide K as a treatment for cancer or any other condition. Um, so I think that's important to take into consideration. And there may be some side effects when taken concurrently with chemo that you may not be able to differentiate between the mushroom supplement or the chemotherapy. And it's also worth noting that there's a theoretical concern about drug nutrient interactions with turkey tail. So it may have an additive effect with glucose lowering and blood pressure lowering medications, and even interfere with some chemotherapy types. So I think it's important to talk with your medical team.
the other uh, mushroom that's used as a supplement because it's not edible is reishi mushrooms. So I wanted to touch on these. Um, and cell studies have shown that reishi mushrooms can have immunomodulatory, renoprotective, anti-inflammatory, and um, hepatoprotective properties. And randomized controlled trials showed enhanced response to conventional treatment and improved quality of life. The evidence is really mixed and consistent findings are needed um, before reishi can really be suggested as an adjunct to uh, chemotherapy treatment. The stu studies have also shown enhanced um, quality of life through using reishi mushrooms, anti-cancer use, specifically for melanoma and triple negative breast cancer. And they may improve cancer-related fatigue in breast cancer patients on endocrine therapy. They also can potentially have side effects like nausea and insomnia and um, may interfere with anticoagulants with doses greater than above three grams per day. And these can also um, potentially have additive effects with glucose lowering or blood pressure lowering medications. The FDA has not approved the use of reishi for cancer or any other condition. So in terms of seasonality, farming, and sustainability of mushrooms, uh, mushrooms are available year round. They're only seasonal in terms of demand. They're grown indoors. And so they have considerably less CO2 production when compared with things like broccoli or tofu, meat, salmon. They're actually one of the most sustainable foods grown today. And because they're grown indoors, there's less need for pesticides. And they can, can be grown on agricultural waste products like sawdust and cotton gin byproducts or bran from refining grains, as well as straw. And California is the second largest mushroom producer in the United States. And there are some local mushroom farms um, here in, near Los Angeles. There's one called Smallhold Farms in Vernon, California, which is just south of downtown LA. Um, and these, the Smallhold brand is sold at uh, pavilions, Whole Foods, and other high-end grocery stores like Lassen's and Erewhon. Um, and speaking of exclusivity, uh, mushroom varieties like morels and truffles and porcinis have resisted cultivation, which accounts for their very high price tag. I also wanted to share a few mushroom preparation tips. Um, so mushrooms are known for their um, umami flavor, and this comes from glutamate. And this flavor, um, this savory, meaty, hearty flavor can be enhanced um, a couple of different ways. You can do this by um, using dried mushrooms and rehydrating them and then use the broth as well. This is often done for things like making risotto or using dried mushrooms in a soup, like hot and sour soup. You can also use things like a truffle mushroom salt or a truffle oil to enhance the flavor of mushrooms. Um, and also think about browning the mushrooms, letting them cook pretty well. Um, and this can bring out the flavor and also prevent that unwanted gray color that can happen with um, particularly white mushrooms when cooked. In terms of cooked versus raw, you wanna cook your mushrooms. Raw mushrooms can contain heat sensitive toxins and carcinogens and heating also makes the mushrooms more digestible and palatable. They're actually really hard to overcook. The cell walls of mushrooms contain chitin, which is a, a component that's found in the shells of crustaceans. And this makes them very, maintain their texture. So they're really great for using in soups because of that. Um, in terms of storage, you can keep them in the original container that they came in. You don't need to put them in a brown paper bag or anything special like that. Um, you can store them in an open Ziploc or a reusable silicon bag. And then when selecting mushrooms, look for fresh mushrooms that are dry, firm, and have a nice earthy smell. Um, you want to avoid mushrooms that are sticky or slimy or smell unpleasant um, or toss them when they start to have those qualities. And then in terms of rinsing or not to rinse, um, you can rinse your mushrooms. It's okay. Um, most mushrooms rinse just fine, but with mushrooms like portobellas that have a lot of gills, um, they can absorb water. And so rinsing um, may influence the texture of the mushroom later on. So with portobellas, you may want to just kind of gently rinse the top. Um, and then if they're pre-cut, you certainly want to, wouldn't want to rinse them then either because they will absorb water. 
Um, so in summary, you know, mushrooms are a healthy food choice year round. They're concentrated and essential and bioactive nutrients. Sunlight exposed mushrooms may help meet vitamin D requirements. And eating mushrooms regularly may lower risk of cancer, delay neurodegeneration, and support a healthy gut and immune system. So it's cold and flu and COVID season. Uh, so think about incorporating mushrooms into your weekly groceries. I know when we think of um, what supports a healthy immune system, we tend to think of citrus and maybe yogurt or things like that, but mushrooms can also play a healthy role. And while there's um, a lot of interesting research on mushroom supplements, there are some concerns regarding the quality and purity of those supplements. So that's what I have for today. I'm gonna to go ahead and, and stop sharing. Megan, thanks so much. So this would be a great chance for if anybody has any questions, you could put it in the chat or you could raise your hand and, and look in. I would just ask that try to make your question generalizable in, in a group setting. We could always um, set up a meeting for one-on-one -on -one, um, counseling if that's, if that's needed. Um, but if anybody, and I see there's one question in the chat, I'll start with that one. I have a question myself as well, and we could go from there. So is endocrine therapy aromatase inhibitor? So do you want to take that, Megan? So I think I'd actually let you take that one. Okay, I'll take that one. Yeah, so endocrine therapy can one. include tamoxifen <laughs> or aromatase inhibitors generally like arimidex, letrozole, fumarol. So I, I would kind of put that in, in the one category. Um, also, just to start things off, and if anyone else has any questions, you mentioned, just out of curiosity, that you know that you, we could put mushrooms in the sun to help synthesize vitamin D. Um, would two hours suffice? Do you, do you have any guidelines on how long they should stay out there? So from my reading, it was 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. 15 minutes was enough to... Um, increase the content to about a daily value's worth of vitamin D. And I was also thinking around this time of year, when we spend so much time indoors, it may be worth standing out there for 15 minutes yourself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Um, I'm going to take some questions from the chat. What is the name of the supplement brand you mentioned that's made in Vernon? Oh, so that's a mushroom producer for edible mushrooms. And the name is Small Hold, Small Hold and Vernon. Great, thank you. Um, somebody else asked, if we only uh, have two or three types of mushrooms over a given month, what do you recommend for general health benefits? I mean, I think all mushrooms have health benefits. I mean, I pointed out some of the ones that are higher in ergothionine and beta-glucans, so I think it would probably be good to consider those, the shiitake, the button, and the oyster mushrooms um, as good options, but I think they're all healthful and they all are high in nutrients. So I'm going to ask another one before I go down the list. And I know it's hard to kind of distill this, but how often should we try, should the average adult try to have mushrooms? Is it like twice a week, every day? Um, what, what, would you, what would you suggest? So, you know, we don't have official guidelines for this. I mean, I think consuming, purchasing mushrooms once a week, maybe consider trying to have a cup a week of mushrooms, I think is reasonable. Okay. The guideline, but there are really no set standards or, or recommendations for that. But I think um, once a week would be great. Okay. Somebody else asked, what is the name of the mushroom farm brands we should look for? So I'm familiar with the small hold one. That's a local farm brand, but there, I know that there are many others in California with being such a large producer. Um, I don't have a particular favorite, but I do tend to look for organic mushrooms. And Diana did put the website for small hold in the in the chat. Um, if everyone would like to um, look in that, um, I, I'm, while we're waiting for to see if there are any other questions, do you have a suggestion on sautéing mushrooms in butter or olive oil <laughs> or or wine or vinegar or because you I, I should mention you have um, some expertise as a chef in addition to being a dietitian. <laughs> so what would you suggest? To the I, novice cook. I'm not a chef, <laughs> um, but I, I, I would cook them in olive oil. I think olive oil is, is a great oil to cook them in. They go great with herbs um, as well. So I think that's a good starting place. 
if you just wanted simply sauteed mushrooms, olive oil, herbs, a little salt, they'd be perfect. Okay. Any any other questions from anyone else? Um, Trish, one more question came up. Can you eat too many in a day, especially while on immunotherapy? It's a great question. That is. So they are known for immune stimulating properties, but there are no guidelines for individuals that are on immunotherapy that they need to limit their, their mushroom consumption from food. Um, but that may be, uh, lead to considerations if you are interested in taking a mushroom supplement. And again, I don't have much evidence for this. I'll just add, if somebody has an autoimmune disorder, you also may want to be cautious on, you know, you know being, being cautious about overdoing it with mushrooms, theoretically. Again, I, I don't have anything to um, base that on necessarily. Okay, let's see. Um, additional polished mushroom soup for Christmas is delicious. Okay, thank you, uh, Sylvia, for that recommendations. Um, Cremini's are no better than white mushrooms? <laughs> uh, so Cremini's are a more mature version of white button mushrooms. So the, the Cremini's would have more antioxidants in them than the white button, but the white button are still good mushrooms. <laughs> they still have good qualities. Uh, Megan, I know you alluded to the dried mushrooms, but, um, and I, I'm, not, I'm no expert in chopping, but when I've gone to the Asian markets, you see you know, just dozens and dozens of varieties of dried mushrooms that I don't see at Ralph's, for example. Um, do you have any suggestions on uh, dried mushroom selections or just experiment? So I love hot and sour soup. So I've, I've made it in the past with, I, think, I believe they're called cloudier mushrooms. I could have that wrong. Um, and rehydrate them in the soup and they have a nice texture. You can also buy other mushrooms and just rehydrate them in water and use them however you want. Um, they just need to soak um, until, they're, um, until they're soft and can be bitten through. You know, so there's, there's a lot of varieties there. Um, and I think you know, they do make a good shelf stable food product that you can stock your pantry with. Great. Diana mentioned for the group that cooking oil helps with vitamin D absorption. That's right, because vitamin D is a fat um, soluble vitamin. Um, one more question. Does cooking mushrooms in marinara sauce or other sauce decrease its health benefits versus sauteing them? I don't see that it would. No, I mean, I think cooking will always decrease a little bit of nutrients, but cooking them in marinara sauce versus oil versus the oven or an air fryer wouldn't decrease the nutrient content. Okay, great. Um, so as, as we're wrapping up and waiting to see if there are any more questions, again, these were meant to be brief and, and, and hope, you know, short and sweet by intention, because I know everyone's busy and we want to just convey little nuggets um, at a time. Please do send us some feedback on topics. We do have an internal list of topics that we'd like to go through um, from, what was our next topic that we discussed? I know we talked about probiotic foods and- and We haven't decided on anything. We haven't decided on the next one. We have a list though. Um, but if there's a certain focus topic that you'd be interested in, um, please feel free to um, email me or, or, or message us on your suggestions. And we'll hopefully um, keep the momentum going with these um, on, on a frequency that, that makes sense and hopefully works for everyone. So to add to that, I did create a survey that should open up when you leave the meeting. So please respond to that with your, with your answers or feel free to send a direct message as well. And for, for those of you that I may not see, um, we wish you all a very, very happy holiday and, and best wishes for the new year. Thank you so much for joining. Megan, thank you so much for taking the time for doing this for everyone. And, and again, th pleasure. thank you all so much for joining. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Please.